978 and King Edward the Martyr has been successfully martyred. Ethelred II, his younger brother, who is better known as Ethelred the Unready, succeeded him. Side note about this name. First, there is no evidence that this was used during Ethelred's lifetime, and second, it's actually a play on words. In Old English, Ethelred means wise counsel, and Unred means bad counsel, so his name actually means wise counsel the poorly counseled, because as will become evident, he trusted the wrong people. So, ascending the throne after your mother probably orchestrated the assassination of your predecessor is not a very good place to start. This was not Ethelred's only problem, since many of the nobles who had their lands given to the church by Ethelred's father, King Edgar, wanted them back, and many just simply took them. This placed Ethelred right in the middle of a conflict between the church and the nobility. Unfortunately for Ethelred, an even bigger threat to his kingdom re-emerged during his reign, the Vikings. The Vikings began raiding shortly after Ethelred became king, but this was small scale until the later 10th century when Viking raids became significantly more deadly. The root of the change from small scale to large comes from Denmark, which at the beginning of Ethelred's reign was ruled by Harald Bluetooth, who also ruled Norway. Harald had professionalised the Danish army, and by the time he was deposed by his son, Swain Forkbid, in 986, it was an extremely potent force. In 991, Ethelred signed a treaty with Richard, the Duke of Normandy, which stipulated that neither would allow the Vikings to use each other's ports to resupply. This didn't do much to deter the Vikings, since they launched their first major attack against the Anglo-Saxons in the same year. They were met at Maldon, which is here, by the elder man Britnoth, who was defeated and his efforts were immortalised in the old English poem, The Battle of Maldon. In response to the defeat, Ethelred was advised to pay the Vikings off. This technically worked since they did leave, but the irony was that since the Vikings could now simply turn up and be paid a huge sum of money, it meant that Ethelred's kingdom became a much more valuable target. So, the sums paid to the Vikings were absolutely massive. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the first tribute was £10,000 of silver or other things of equivalent value. The only reason that the English were able to raise so much money was because of how centralised the kingdom had become over the previous century. The reforms had allowed the king's officials, notably Shire Reeves, to collect taxes efficiently. The idea to pay off the Vikings came from the Archbishop of Canterbury, Sidgeric, who himself had to pay off the Vikings to prevent them from burning down the cathedral at Canterbury. Ethelred's Viking trouble was compounded with the problems he had with his nobility. Many of the Viking raids were occurring in lands which had only recently been added to the kingdom, and the loyalties of said land's lords were still shaky. To keep the kingdom together, Ethelred made many donations of lands to the eldermen from outside Wessex, making them much more influential. The year 1002 saw two major events. The first was that Ethelred married Richard of Normandy's sister, Emma, and this was the start of the close relationship between the Anglo-Saxon kings and the Dukes of Normandy. The second was the St. Brice's Day Massacre. This was an order given by Ethelred to slaughter all of the Danes within his kingdom on the 13th of November. The fact that this order was given implies that there was a genuine terror felt over the threat the Danes posed. Naturally, this order wasn't genuinely enforceable, since large swathes of the kingdom were made up of Danes, but many massacres were carried out and the loss of life was huge. It is likely that the invasion in 1003 by King Swain Forkbid was a response to the massacre, which may have taken the life of his sister. Swain landed in East Anglia and sacked the city of Norwich, but the fighting against the English was costly, and so in 1005 he returned to Denmark. The next year he was back and ransacked the south of the kingdom before being bought off, this time with £36,000. Ethelred wanted to be better prepared for future attacks from the Vikings, and so commissioned the building of a large fleet of 300 ships. Unfortunately for Ethelred, the next year there was a dispute between two eldermen, a certain Eadric Strayona of Mercia and another called Wolfnoth. Things got out of hand, Wolfnoth stole 20 ships, Eadric followed with 80, ran them ashore, and Wolfnoth ended up burning them. Thus, the new navy, due to a petty dispute, was shrank by a third, meaning it wouldn't be able to stop a Viking fleet if one turned up. Well, one did turn up soon after, led not by Swain, but by Thorkell the Tall. Thorkell and his men ravaged many parts of the country, including Oxford. In 1011, Thorkell laid siege to Canterbury and seized the city along with the archbishop there, Elfhea, who he tried to ransom. Elfhea refused to be ransomed, and so some of Thorkell's men murdered him. Thorkell, like most of the Vikings at this time, was a Christian and was either disgusted with the murder or believed he could no longer control his men, and so took the troops most loyal to him and defected to fight for Ethelred. The Viking invasions overshadowed most of Ethelred's reign, but he was responsible for continuing administrative reform and issuing laws which he upheld strictly, very strictly. Ethelred's most famous law code is known as the Wantage Code, which notably set up a local body of 12 thanes who would preside over trials and decide on a charged man's innocent or guilt. Some consider this to be the origin of the jury, but be aware that many dispute this. Reforms aside, Ethelred's main concern was still the Vikings, and in 1013, Swain Forkbid returned. Many of the old areas of the Danelaw accepted Swain as their king almost immediately, and by the end of the year, Ethelred had fled to Normandy, and Swain was now the king of the English, Norway, and Denmark. 
Swain thus began his long and prosperous reign, which lasted for five whole weeks before he died. The nobles negotiated for Ethelred to return, providing he abided by certain rules and was a better ruler. The Danish army weren't going to allow this, and they declared Swain's son, Knut, as king. Ethelred managed to drive Knut away fairly quickly, but he returned in 1015 with a much larger army. Ethelred's son, Edmund, who fought most of the battles against Knut, was essentially in open rebellion against his father and was in control of a sizeable portion of the kingdom. To make matters worse, the elder Miniadric of Mercia betrayed Ethelred and joined Knut. Ethelred died in April 1016 and his son was declared king. However, after many losses, Edmund agreed to divide the kingdom between himself and Knut, but this didn't last since Edmund died in November of the same year. Thus, Knut received the entire kingdom and was the first monarch to title himself as the King of England, as opposed to the title used by his Anglo-Saxon predecessors, King of the English. So, Knut is most famous for commanding the tide to stop crashing on the shores of England. For this, he's often portrayed as being a bit mad, but in fact it was a pious act and was to show that even a king's power pales in comparison to God's. So soon after he became king, Knut took the liberty of murdering any English noble he didn't like, such as Eadric, presumably because of the whole betraying his previous king thing. Knut also raised a colossal amount of money to pay off the army which had won him the throne, which placed the kingdom under further strain. This strain is evidenced by the fact that also in 1018, the Scottish invaded and managed to seize all of this territory. Soon after this, Knut's older brother Harold died and Knut inherited Denmark. After gaining Denmark, Knut had to balance the needs of each of his kingdoms, and as his reign progressed, he spent more and more time in Denmark. During his first trip there, Knut sent a letter addressed to the English people, in which he declares that he will be a just ruler, but importantly, he stated that, I went myself with the men who accompanied me to Denmark, and I have taken measures so that never henceforth shall hostility reach you from there, as long as you support me rightly and as long as my life lasts. So Knut was offering the English peace against the Vikings, which was something England had not had in many decades. Knut also made a show of continuity by first marrying Ethelred's widow, Emma of Normandy, although side note, he actually had two wives, the second being a Mercian lady called Elfgifu. Alongside marrying the widowed queen, Knut continued to use the laws of the previous Anglo-Saxon kings, most notably those of Edgar. This doesn't mean that he didn't change the way the kingdom was run, however. Knut divided the kingdom into four earldoms, which would be run by his trusted earls. The earldoms were Wessex, Mercia, Northumbria and East Anglia. Initially, Wessex, which held England's capital of Winchester, was directly under Knut's rule, but towards the end of his reign in the 1030s, Knut appointed an Englishman called Godwin as the Earl of Wessex. One major legacy of the division of England into earldoms was that it concentrated land and wealth into the hands of very few people, and a weak king could potentially be challenged by one of his earls. Spoiler alert, this happens. Another change was that Knut established a group of bodyguards called Housecarls who also acted as the king's emissaries and importantly were very expensive to maintain since there were several thousand of them. In 1028, Knut also managed to gain Norway, mostly through turning up off the coast with a large combined Anglo-Danish navy and looking a bit scary. In 1035, Knut died, leaving the succession open to multiple potential heirs. Knut had wanted the son he'd had with Queen Emma, Harther Knut, to succeed him, but Harther Knut was busy in Denmark fighting a rebellion. To make things more complicated, Knut's son from his first marriage, Harold, better known as Harold Harrowfoot, was the only potential heir in England. Two sides formed concerning who should succeed Knut. Knut's first wife, Elfgifu, and the Earls of Mercia and Northumbria favoured Harold, whereas Godwin, the Earl of Wessex, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Queen Emma favoured Harther Knut. The fact that women like Emma and Elfgifu were extremely influential was down to the culture of Anglo-Saxon England. In other European societies, women had significantly less power and rights than in Anglo-Saxon England. This does not mean that women were seen as equals, since they absolutely were not, but unlike other kingdoms, women could own, inherit and dispose of property, which meant that they could also be patrons. They could act as witnesses for trials and charters, and if they were victims of crimes, the compensation for them was the same as men. Earl Godwin and Emma eventually realised that Harther Knut wasn't going to show, and so accepted Harold as their king. For many of the nobles, the return of an English king would mean that they were open to invasion by the Vikings again, which was expensive. In fact, the payment of tribute to the Vikings, known as the Geld, was Europe's only general land tax, which applied to everyone, peasant and noble alike, which shows how centralised the government was and how afraid of the Vikings they were. In 1037, Harold was coronated as king, but his reign, for the most part, was uneventful and it is believed that his mother was the real power behind the throne. Harold died in 1040 and the nobles of England invited Harthacunut to become king, which he did, but not after arriving with an army, just to be sure. This army, much like Knut's, needed paying, so more geld was raised. Harther Knut's reign was very short, and he died in 1042, but it's important to remember that that was common, since of the 12 kings who ruled the United England up until this point, 8 ruled for less than a decade, and 6 died under the age of 30. Harther Knut was the last Scandinavian to rule England, and marked the end of the Royal House of Denmark, and the return of the Royal House of Wessex. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and thank you for watching. If you'd like to know more, there are some book recommendations in the description.